Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Ajin. With the newfound identity that India, Bharat, is today kind of looking at, and of course the growing space and the growing place of our country in this world and the world order, we need to understand what is our national security strategy. What is it going to contain? What are the most important things that will be a part of this particular strategy? Why is a strategy needed for any country? And how do we as citizens analyze it? For that, I have with me one of my favorite, favorite speakers, Lieutenant General P.G. Kamath. Sir, thank you so much for taking out the time. I mean, your analysis is my personal favorite. Let me just say that. Uh, it's it's always brutally honest to the point and fantastic, if I may say that. So thank you so much for taking out the time, sir. And I would love to learn from you with regards to what is our national security strategy going to be going forward. Thank you, Adi. This is my privilege. Firstly, we have celebrated the Amrit Mahotsav 75 years. Yes, sir. Just two weeks before, in the uh, last week of August, Ministry of Home Affairs has a conference on national security strategy attended by 750 delegates. It has the DGPs, IGPs of CAPF, of the states, Home Secretary, the two deputy NSAs. There is no defense secretary, no foreign secretary, two days camp, 750 attendees. Fine, I have no hassles on that. It must be a sounding board. What are the points to be taken? And it's called a conference on national security strategy. So far, fine, no, no issues. Five years before 2018, the Prime Minister asked the National Security Advisor, NSA, to frame a national security strategy. And he gave him a defense planning committee in order to do that. It consists the chairman is NSA himself with the CDS, the three chiefs, foreign secretary, defense secretary, secretary expenditure. Five years later, nothing has come out. So if you really see as a nation, there is one Ministry of Home pursuing one national security strategy. There is one NSA who is pursuing a national security strategy. They are in isolation and there is no Home Secretary in the Defense Planning Committee. It comes to a conclusion that they have really not understood what a future warfare, future hybrid warfare is going to really, uh, what, is, what is the environment of a future hybrid warfare. Let me tell you in brief, what is a future hybrid warfare? Let us, I am just visualizing a scenario, nothing. I might be visualizing a bit more, but it's okay. That's what we are, should be prepared to. Let's say a conventional two-front war with China and Pakistan is taking place. Offensive forces are going, defensive deterrence forces are there, and attacks are taking place. Artillery fire, missile, all sorts of ATGM, air force is gone into strikes and defending. Some missiles are falling in our cities. Navy has gone into Indian Ocean towards the Malacca Strait. In this hot war scenario, what is going to ha happen? There is a subconventional war also taking place. That's what is hybrid warfare. The terrorism is taking place. Insurgency of Maoists have been activated. Sleeper cells of the enemy who are sleeper cells in different parts of the country with all arms and ammunition are ready in order to break the bridge, destroy blow bridges, destroy lines of communication so that the war waking resources from the hinterland do not go into the forward areas to feed the war machinery. You know, when a war takes place, number of logistics, war waking resources, ammunition, oil, fuel, petrol, and uh, rations, uh, everything, engineer stores have to all move in front. And this is the ideal time for them to disrupt our road and rail communications. This is happening. Sleeper cells have been activated. Sleeper cells are around the airfields also with probably a shoulder fired uh, uh, missile systems uh, in order to destroy the takeout during the takeoff and landing. 
and also the uh, what we call sleeper cells will be hitting your ammunition bases, ammunition depots, logistic centers. All these needs to be protected. Plus, the society, the India is riddled, the entire society is riddled with the natural fault lines, caste, the religion, uh, uh, ethnicity, and uh, the tribal versus uh, what we call plain people. As it is happening, a fault line has been activated in Manipur. You know it well. So these different fault lines, especially of the religions, we are actually we are quite a boiling pot, very susceptible to it. All what you have to take, uh, like the recent statement made by one of the ministers that such and such religion has to be exterminated, <coughs> eradicated. Another religion fellow says he has to be eradicated. Some cattle, uh, a carcass of cattle thrown here and carcass of a pig or sign thrown out here and in order to cause the roadblocks. What happened in the Mewath where the roadblock and uh, what happened? Uh, these are all parts of a hybrid warfare which is taking place. What about the Balaso train incident where the insiders mm -hmm. were involved? These type of incidents are also likely to take place. At the same time, the cyber attacks will come on the air traffic controls. Or your aeroplane, your, your entire aircraft, your landing and taking off might all come to a standstill. Cyber attack can come on your railway network. Your trains are standstill. You are not able to move your mobilization and additional, additional reserves from the eastern sector to western or northern, wherever we are not able to move. I am just visualizing a scenario, Adi. What all can take place? Hate speeches are on, psychological warfare is on, <clears throat> in order to break the will of the people. Information warfare, fake news, what happened in you know, 2012 and 2020 in Karnataka, where the Northeast people were uh, forcing, were uh, going on the trains back to Guwahati with the threat calls. What happened in Bihar with the fake news that Biharis are being attacked or uh, what you call, are being ill-treated by the locals. And they are all wanting to go back. You can see the disruption of national highway, the railway traffic, everything. Then cyber attack come on your financial systems. Your, uh, your uh, what you call, <coughs> ATM cards, ATMs will not be, you cannot be used. Cities also certain artillery missiles are falling. Fault lines have been exasperated. Under these circumstances, you have to visualize, you have to fight a hot war in the Indian Ocean, in the air, in the space. Satellites are being targeted. Your navigation system is off. Your network system is off. And that is the time you have to carry on with an offensive. Do we really understand what a hybrid warfare is and what type, what the country has to face, what all threats internally, externally, space, underwater, cyber, information, psychological warfare in order to create a climate of collapse in the country during the hot war situation. So we have to have a national, I'm not trying to say we cannot win over the psyche war. We can, but first visualize the scenario. Have a combined, yes. cogent uh, national security strategy. Harden your systems in order to see in a, in a methodical way so that we are able to win a war in this melee of, a, of destruction and collapse, uh, administrative collapse, we are still able to win the war. So we have to have, now let us say, 2018, five years since, still our national security strategy is not there. Why? The DPC is there. They are very, these all army officers, senior generals are trained in making a national security strategy. The DPC, the member is uh, the uh, CIDS, the uh, chief of uh, uh, the, uh, the IDS. He knows, means he has got an entire army of uh, senior officers and very able fellows are under him. It's not that it's not ready, but it is just not being accepted. Uh, there are dime a dozen defense uh, security strategies everywhere. Please do not mistake me if I say it's not there. But what is the use? It has only academic value. When it has a value, when this, um, uh, this security strategy <coughs> vetted by the, uh, the defense minister, put up to the chief uh, prime minister, 
goes through the parliament cabinet committee. I don't say parliament because see in the parliament, I do not think any of us have got the wisdom, the inclination or, or, or even the requirement in order that it goes through a parliament. In US, it goes through a senate. It's done once in a four years. 2018 or there, 2022, one was held. It goes. But our, our parliament, with all due apologies, you have seen, once you're there, there will be some slogan here, slogan here. So I am uh, diluting it instead of going through the parliament. It should go to the parliamentary cabinet committee, parliamentary committee of all mm. parties. There is a one of a, a parliamentary cabinet on uh, uh, a committee on security. Then comes to the CCS and CCPS. They have a combined session approved, signed by the prime minister and the members. Then it has the security sanctity on which the other other uh, government agencies like uh, uh, agriculture, everyone else who are out there are able to frame their sub-strategies in order to reach the national objective. When you don't have a thing which has been sanctified, and also when you say it has long-term goals, short-term goals, when you have long and short-term goals, they say objective, what are to be achieved? If this capacity building has to be take place in agriculture, in food, in oil, in energy, in trade, in number of other facets, what do you need? You have to have a long and short term and we have to empower our resources yeah. in order to reach these empirical targets which you have set in. So national security strategy encompasses. I am not I am uh, taking off the grand strategy on top because we that uh, takes much. Let's do from national defense, uh, uh, the national security strategy. So there is a need for us to have a political decisiveness uh, like the prime minister had the political decisiveness go, go in for the CDS. Similar decisiveness has to be exercised in order to say, please have a national security strategy. Time given to you is two years. Come have a credit and present it to me. Now, now at this time, I know your fellows who read and they will be passing, bombarding me with the following. That it's already there. It's not known. It's secret. It is there in subterranean tunnel guarded by uh, black cats and Malinois Belgian dots with 10 lots. So it is there. But that is of no use. It has to be sanctified. It's a living and guiding document for entire government. The classified portion of a bit little might be there with the Malinois dog or say, wherever you want to keep it. That is with the closely guarded army, armed forces, people will have it. I am not trying to tell that. But the basic concept of a national security strategy for the country to, call, uh, to follow, for the other government department, government agencies to have their own sub-strategy, have their own sub-objectives. Each of the sub-strategy which they have will culminate into a national security strategy when they achieve it. <coughs> it is also a bit applicable to the corporates to increase our capability towards what the government wants to do. So these are the things which has to be there. So there is, uh, hiding it somewhere, it uh, means uh, it's all, uh, please pardon my words, it's all washed. It's not, yeah. it is not there, simple. No, no, true, sir. I, um, yeah. Any Anything, uh, Adi? No, no, no. What you're saying is absolutely spot on, sir. Okay. Now, I will also tell you, there is something difference between a policy and strategy. A policy is just a policy which you can. But when you come to strategy, it is hands-on. What is hands-on? You say, these are the ob this is the objective, ends. It's ends, means, and ways. If this is my strategic objective, what are the means available to me? That is my comprehensive national power. That the instruments of national power, the political power, the economic power, <coughs> science and technological power, diplomatic power, the soft power, cyber power, all these powers are applied. Though these are the means, the method of application is the ways. So strategy is an objective end, the means and resources to achieve this end. 
and ways. How do you apply this in different ways in order to achieve the objective? It is just a triangle. Ends means ways. Hmm. So it is hands on. It's a living document. It is practical. It is there for everyone to see it and frame their sub strategies. Okay. Now, Adi, I will ask you a simple question. <coughs> what is the political aim of this country? I went through the constitution. Constitution has got the values and all written there. Core values. I am with it. Fine. Justice, social, economic, political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of opportunities, fraternity, assuring dignity, all the core, core values. They respect them. That is required in the preamble. But what is the aim of your country? When a country is formed, what is the aim for this country to form? That's true. What is the aim of this country? When the country formed, with what aim did you make this country? <laughs> I went through further in the depth. And then I thought the best way to identify and extract the aim of this country is from the oath taken by the Constituent Assembly. Uh, if you know the first, uh, the Constituent Assembly acted as also the first parliament. Hmm. On 15th August, they took an oath. The oath is good. I am happy with the oath. Do you know what they said? This ancient land, to attain her rightful place in the world, okay? rightful place in the world, second was make a full and willing contribution to the promotion of world peace and welfare of mankind. Fine. The second one is more uh, philosophical. The first hmm. one says rightful place in the world. <clears throat> what it means with the natural resources, with your expanse, with your population, you have to be one of the global powers. That is your interpretation. Yeah. Our rightful place in the world today is we are in a multipolar world. We are one of the important poles. So we have to be one of the global, not the global power, one of the global powers. That's what our political aim and visages. <coughs> Taking this, what Hitler said, my country should be on the uh, under the sun, means the most important. He tried for it. We are, we, are, we are quite moderate that knowing our resources and all, we have to be one of the global powers. Article 13C also says <coughs> that additional land, if you get can be incorporated and be brought under the constitution. Constitution. See, you see how it is. They have, they have framed it well. If you go on an invasion and capture, what does Bhishma say in Shanti Parv? The duties of a king expand their uh, uh, kingdom so as to bring prosperity to your people. He has said that to bring prosperity or to expand. A joy, higher geography will give you a geo, better economics. That's what, for the reason. And third thing he says, so you have to expand your land, at least get hold of your land. And the one of aspect of the constitution, fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and unity and integrity of your nation. This is the uh, this is one clause which cannot be compromised. Because you have a nation, you have all the other rights. If the unity and integrity of your nation is not there, what will you do with your justice, social, political, economic and all? First, have your nation in there. Mm. So it is the uncompromising clause in the preamble. Please remember. <coughs> so now, from the political aim, you have to be a global power. You take out the, now you come to national interest. <coughs> because from global power means you have to analyze it now. To be a global power, what is your national interest? What do you, okay? yeah. Then you come to secure and stable borders is one of the most important. External environment, friendly and peaceful to you in order to see that internally you are, are able to grow. Then 
develop the internal environment is so conducive and harmonious for an individual and the country to develop to one's full potential. Every this 1.4 billion individuals are born with immense personal talents in order to see that each of the individual blooms to his full potential by his education, by giving him opportunities. That is the way the country grows. So that is also your national interest. Your national interest not only encompasses the sovereignty of the area, geographical area, but to the welfare and development of every citizen of this country. That's why you have found a nation. <coughs> So from this, there might be others also. I am not going through them. Everything will be in time. Then from the national interest, you come to the strategic goals. If these are my interests, that we have to be a global power. We have to be a, what you call a, a, a sovereignty of our lands. We have to make our people happy and make them develop. So you have a strategic goal. What are the goals possible? I am just... A, Telling it as an example, because the more minds have to sit in it, we should have a $5, five trillion dollar economy by second such time. So your national interest will get certain empirical values when you put the strategic goals. You got me? This is so that there is something tangible you can achieve. It can't be you be a global power and I sleep. All right? To be a global power, you add data you had statistics to your capabilities five trillion dollar economy in 2026 let's say so then you become a member of united nations security council you should aim to be a member of nuclear suppliers group you have to restore sovereignty over your borders which you have lost mm. ability to do sea control over the entire northern indian ocean Develop a hydrogen bomb with megaton yield. Develop a ICBM beyond 10,000 kilometers as a deterrent. <clears throat> Have food production from 330 million tons to 500 million tons. Your food grain export should go from, from the present $24 billion to $50 billion. Similarly, your targets for water, targets for environment. 24% of the forest should be made into 35% of forests. So, this afforestation, so road and railway communication. So, further, you have number of targets of strategic goals you put. And then, and once you have put goal, ends, na? goals are ends. Now, you apply your means. That is your comprehensive national power. To achieve those ends. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And the ways. So these are done at the different levels. So, so what I am again trying to say, everything, it is so, so much involved in it. Everyone has to put his mind and come to a, what are the considerations, what are the things which should be added in a national security strategy. Yeah. I mean, very in interesting introduction, sir. Thank you so much for that. See, the main thing that uh, a layman like me would look at as a national security strategy would be to create a structure somehow to have a grand narrative as you were talking about the grand objective of the country, where, where the country is supposed to be. And for that, coming down to security part, what would the military need to achieve those objectives? Police, this, that. And then create the downward trend. So I think what you've kind of brought out is very, very interesting. So, the most important thing, of course, in this country is politics. Uh, what will be the political objectives? Uh, and today, geopolitical scenario around the world is really, really, I mean, hot. You, you, one can't say you're updated because every minute there's something or the other happening. It true, so, true. You know, uh. for people, people like me, it's very difficult to update yourself. So, what should be the political objective of a national security policy or strategy going forward for our country, sir? <clears throat> See, uh, yeah, yeah. I will tackle this question in a slightly different matter. What have been in the past 
too many conflicts have taken place. What have mm. been their political objective? Then I'll come down to what would be our political objective for a war. Okay. Now let us say invasion has been a political objective of China. China invaded Tibet in 5051. China invaded the South China Sea by a creeping invasion right from the 90s till 2010, 20 years. Iraq invaded Kuwait for war, oil. Russia invaded Crimea for assimilation. You see, so proper wars with absolutely very clear cut objectives have been taking place. Now, let us say liberation, more magnanimous. US came and drove out the Iraqis and liberated Kuwait. India and Mutti Bahaini liberated East Pakistan. Argentina tried to liberate Malvinas, okay. not mm. successful. <clears throat> we have still to liberate Atsaikin and POK. Our, 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 uh, um, uh, our mandate is still there. Then third objective is on invitation. India went to Sri Lanka and Maldives on separately on invitation. US has been invited to Philippines to open its bases again, all which are packed. Agreed? Then next political objective which have taken place, I am only quoting history to you, teaching a lesson. China, India, they came to teach us a lesson. China went to teach a lesson to Vietnam, but did not, could not do it much. US went to Afghanistan almost to teach a lesson and occupation and came out absolutely back to square one. Next uh, political objective, you see, all this have taken place, regime change. U.S. went to Iraq for regime change. U.S. and NATO went to Libya for regime change. Regime change. So, so over a period of last 30, 40 years, there have been very cut, clear cut objectives, political objectives. Now, let us state India in the present context from here on. What should be our political objective in case a war is thrust on us or we are ready for a war? Let's be frank. Huh? One is acceptance of IB on our terms. We will go to war. Why not? You have lost your sovereign land. Security of your borders is inherent in your preamble of your constitution, where the mm. unity and integrity of the nation is there. Unity is for the people, integrity is for the geographical area. Stop interference in the internal affairs or Pakistan or whatever. Stop sponsored te terrorism in our area. These are all political aims. Liberate Tibet. Tibet comes to you, which is already comes to you. You need to liberate Tibet is your political aim. Stop CPEC, CPEC from Indian territory in PO through the POK. It's a political aim. Liberate and assimilate POK. It's the time is ripe. Everyone in POK wants to join India. We may have to take this uh, the opportunity <coughs> and strike. Then undermine Communist Party of China. This is your political aim. You indirectly, you indirectly disrupt his trade. See that is, uh, <coughs> there is a lot of unemployment and all. It is absolutely, or even in a war, which will, uh, if it takes place, you may have a stalemate. It is enough to uh, shame us, undermine CPC. Because CPC is in a very, very delicate political framework. Without an election, they are just managing a country, owning a country where there is no wish of the people. That political power, internal political power as our country has, democratically elected people mm. choosing a government and from that the cabinet is formed in order to manage the wish of every individual, the entity is there with our government constitutionally, but they are very weak. So they cannot afford a failure. Undermine Pat Army, which is the arbitrator in entire in our Western side. So these could be our political objectives when we think of uh, what should India do. Uh, and any of this is workable uh, political objective, but 
what early. What has to be taught is we have to choose one of the objectives and then prepare the nation. With their, prepare the comprehensive national power of the nation in order to achieve this objective. That's what, what I is trying to say. Once it has been sanctified by the, uh, by the CCP and CCS, then it is incumbent the capacity building will take place. If the capacity building has to take place, budgeting will take place. Otherwise, how is the defense budget? Sita Raman uh, manages the defense budget in the budget speak in one sentence. No, it's not. You have to build up. It's not the previous budget. Uh, do cut and paste and put in the next. What are the strategic capacity building you have to do each year? So that after three years, the capacity of Indian armed forces is so much, you know, in order to achieve this political objective. So these are the things which has to be done. And selection of political objective is one of the, what you call, very, very important things in the entire uh, gamut of framing a national security strategy. I mean, so the, the the gambit is actually quite wide. I mean, uh, it's not a it's not a very limited sort of a scope. It's very it's a very wide gambit. And one of the things that we see is that everything is encompassing security today, sir. And everything has a threat. I mean, we never heard of grain warfare. Uh, you could call <laughs> you could call what what what's happening in the Black Sea as grain warfare. Absolutely. You could call it political warfare, diplomatic warfare, media warfare. I mean, there's this everything has has an offensive and a defensive capability to itself. So how does one? I mean, I I don't know what exactly the national security team was doing, making the policy or whatever that they were doing, but it seems quite a difficult task because you you gotta kind of encompass all that vastness of. Uh, Trends today and probably trends in the future. I mean, Russians seem to be a little far-sighted. They protected their economy. Uh, what do you think should be a part of this particular strategy as far as security is concerned? See, firstly, let us say, why have you not made it now so far? Yeah, yeah. Why, is that was... why are you starting now? <clears throat> See, firstly. The entire thing, when you talk of national security strategy, as you rightly said, security of food, security of water, security of trade, security of environment, security of land borders, security of sea borders, security of space, security of satellites, security of underwater, security of maritime trade, security of uh, what you call air routes. So the everything is it comes from different ministries. It has to come. But my main thing is. Because, because, Adi, we have not had one. How much we have suffered? I just yeah. want to tell you one or two uh, things. When the India became independent, we were on high moral grounds. Without understanding the rough and tumble of real geopolitics. Mohandas Gandhi was flying with non violence high up in the sky. <laughs> Below him, Mr. Nehru was flying with one non-violence and one uh, non-aligned. We have no enemies. We are no violence. We are non-aligned. We belong to no party. I won't go further into it. I'll give you the result. One year, four months after this high-sounding ideals and after independence, we lost 78,114 square kilometers of POK by going to uh, prematurely to the United Nations. With one third of our JNK uh, state in their hands, we went. So from high that, you know, non-violent, non this one, this doesn't, the, the country doesn't expect you in one year, four months to lose 78,114 square kilometers. Three and a half years from independence, Tibet was invaded and captured. 17 point agreement between uh, uh, what you call Tibetans, which was forced to Tibetans and was signed on 23rd May 1951. 
entire Tibet. So we lost. Say, so a peaceful Indo-Tibetan border became a hostile, unstable Sino-Indian border. Because we don't know what we want, Adi. Six and a half years, 29th April 1954, we signed the Trade and Protocol and gave legally, formally, Tibet to China. Tibet is a part of China, is the heading of this. So you gave, when you gave the Tibet the least, what you can say, when you acquised the invasion of China on Tibet and its assimilation, least bargain you could have taken. I have told about this earlier also. Yeah, our Indo-Tibetan border will be Sino-Indian border and there is no compromise on it. This is the time you should have taken in writing from the Chinese. Otherwise, we will not let that Tibet is a part of China. Indo-Tibetan border is Sino-Indian border and it is like this. So a hostile border. We, we acquired by our strategic designs, we acquired a hostile border. It was a design. Look at this. I am guessing. 10 years, 1957, <clears throat> China had already constructed 56-57, the tibet Xinjiangja G219 highway. Without our knowledge, we lost that cycle. Look at our strategic vision. Our strategic vision is lose the territory, which is told in the preamble that unity and integrity of your nation is there. 15 years later, 1962, <coughs> we formally lost the 37,555 square kilometers of Hatsaki. A nation was defeated, a civilization was humiliated. Did not have sense to use uh, air force. You, uh, instrument of national power you have to use. Did not use our air force in combat role. Array, my, when you don't have strategy, you don't know what you want, what you call, what you want. I, it is so, so, <coughs> so, so infuriating when you see how this great, peaceful, high flying leaders did all these strategic mistakes and the country still pardons them. Mm. <clears throat> do, do you need what you call? So do, do you need any more proof for the price a nation has to pay for not having a cogent uh, national security strategy? No, I will yeah. give you more. 1965. We never used our Navy in there to blockade uh, yeah. Pakistan. Are you mm. are fighting a war, Navy is sitting. Means you don't think you lost, you gave Hagipir Pass to Joria and all, leave that. I'm not uh, trying to say you lost Hagipir, you gave, you gave back Hagipir Pass. <clears throat> then in 1971, we won a fantastic war. We liberated a country, of course, I want to add with the help of Mufti Bain. Then Indira Gandhi was feted as Durga, the winner of the war. That's all. Nothing. I also feted for it. Yeah, decisive. But see, carried on with the Autar for too long. <coughs> July 72, she sat with the Bhutto. Bhutto had brought Benazir Bhutto also in order to call auntie, auntie, or whatever they have to call. And this Autar yielded everything. Blessed him with 97,382 prisoners, to be precise. <coughs> Did not take our 54 criminal, uh, prisoners of war back. The war criminals who committed uh, genocide were also returned. Blessed Bhutto with their hands. It's their personal property. Do you have, if you have a national security strategy, you know what to ask for. There was no army, uh, uh, kind of what you call, uh, uh, person from uniformed fellows to advisor during the July 72. C and DP Dhar gave away the entire prisoners of war without taking our 54 back. Mm. <coughs> because when you go there, you don't know what to ask for. 
Yes, you wicked POK, entire prisoners with honor and dignity will come to you. 91 lakh prisoners means about how many? 20 lakh uh, family members. Yeah, yeah. If we don't send them, what will happen? And this leverage we lost means we won a which we won the battle, but handed over victory to Bhutto. <clears throat> Do you still want to know why we are not why, why should we not have a national security strategy? So we do not know what to ask for. You know, before this uh, 19th uh, <clears throat> military commanders conference on 14th of August or something, in July, the same Wangi met the uh, met the foreign minister and NSA in different times in order to articulate a common platform with them. Earlier also, we almost, uh, in the five, you see number of articles I have written on the five power, five point disagreement, where we accused, we told, yes, it is also likely to be our mistake, means almost to that point we have agreed. Mutually, we will have peaceful relation. We had peaceful relations, it is you who disrupted it. Don't we say that? Have we disrupted the, uh, uh, the thing on the borders? Who came mm. for the 1957 uh, LAC and occupied it? <laughs> yeah. So we are, my main thing is, see, this is my personal opinion. I might be wrong. The prime minister is one time we have a decisive prime minister who can take a decision. But is he is not being given correct advice due to which the what we want to achieve on the security front is not being achieved. And there is a disconnect between the uniformed people and the prime minister because the, there is national security advisor who is coming who will not let this contact happen. Otherwise, why don't you have a national defense security strategy? From 2018 to 2023, you do not have one. So you everything doesn't when you when a person has to be under has to understand what in the national security strategy, when you come down to military strategy, you also say what will the enemy do militarily and how I will stem him militarily. Your economy and all doesn't come into play. Mountains are restricted. Where you can deploy the entire forces get restricted. Your logistic is restricted. Your deployability is restricted. The amount of resources you can pump in is restricted. So it doesn't mean these entire 2.5 million people will come on the border. The army will come on the border and start attacking you. It doesn't happen that way. So Indian diplomats are proud to do appeasement for peace. They will are, they have also been proud of giving away land for peace. Yeah, we 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 got a sad history, so there's no question about it. So let's talk about the military a little bit, sir. Of course, uh, military development and future trends in the military would depend on entirely what the national security strategy wants the military to do. For example, and the most popular opinion is taking back POK. Just just for a heck of an example, that is a that is a very very extremely difficult military operation. It's not something as easy as it is touted to be. Uh, from just a non-military perspective, one it is full of hills, so it's going to be slow as heck. Uh, it's like Kargil times hundred. As a matter of fact, we got a very strong big stronghold in Skardu. Uh, which is their airfield and this and that and the other. And they've got connections otherwise as well. So keeping just not the POK factor, but a whole lot of other military uh, requirements that India has, What? how does the military ingratiate itself into this particular strategy? Sir? I'll try to answer your question. It's an incisive question, but I'll try to answer. I will not give you a direct answer, but I'll tell you. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. How the national security strategy converts into military security, military strategy. Now, let us take 
ए प्रीवियस वॉर नाइनटीन सेवेंटी वन डाटा ओके किस पाकिस्तान ऑपरेशन आई विल नॉट इवन टॉक on the eastern side indian armed forces planned a strategic offensive okay so the political direction given by the ccpa and the ccs liberate east pakistan okay that's the word that is the political objective given now it is left for the generals admirals and <coughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, what you call air chiefs to come to the military objective. What is the link? If you are given a political objective, liberate East Pakistan. You have to identify from this which are the military, which is the military objective. The capture of it will automatically attain the political objective. Once again. the political objective gives the selection of military objective capture of military objective will fulfill the political objective objective so now though i will not say how the sequence of planning initially dot was not there i will not go into it so indian army had two choices one military objective is destroy the pakistan army in east pakistan <laughs> second is to capture the geographical and communication center of dhaka dhaka capital if you had taken the first one you should have gone from one locality to the other one locality to the other it would have taken days and days and days to reduce each and every locality destroy its forces and then reach dhaka knowing your past experience of cease fire suddenly a cease fire will come we will be uh, we will be burdened with one cease fire bloody line in the north one cease fire in the east we have that finished so indian army selected the selection of objective dhaka within 14 days dhaka was there it was the center of gravity of the enemy it is hitting the solar plexus and the entire forces fell apart and they surrendered Hmm. so the capture of dhaka which was a military objective enabled the fulfillment of the political objective of liberation of east pakistan okay <clears throat> so keep in the same analogy in mind we should have from the political objective we have to have one military objective in sino indian war i will not identify i am not supposed to identify you will have a objective military objective which will fulfill now let us say humiliate the cpc if it is there or if you say liberate uh, what you call tibet tibet if one has to liberate tibet it's not easy not <coughs> you should have a growing insurgency there you should make a tibet ripe for insurgency and pillows are active there in order to help you out like mutti bahini and then probably strike at one of the objectives in uh, tibet or threaten it being so close to it that time he'll also attack so when you think of a military objective you envisage the military capabilities of the enemy what is the enemy likely to do should he attack us and how will i stop these offensive of the enemy in these respective areas and which is the place where i will go on the offensive and cause a stalemate and causing a stalemate will humiliate the cpc so like that it is a where with all how the offensive operations will unfold of the enemy how our offensive and defensive un operations unfold of ours which are the objectives which he will select which are the objectives which i will select which are the objectives which i will deter him from attaining achieving and which are the objectives which i will capture in spite of his uh, deterrence 
all this is a so much of details which the military planners have to do. And hence, the selection of military objectives is one of the most difficult things for the generals to appreciate after a political objective is given by the, uh, by it's an instrument of political instrument given by the, uh, what we call uh, political leadership. <clears throat> now, when you have a military objective, I am still not gone for war. I am just thinking mm. if this is so. If required, we. Mm. This is so. Do I have the resources to do this? You got me? If I do not have the resources, we have to do capacity building of our army, air force and navy in order to achieve this objective. How much more force levels I need? And what is the budgeting and what is the capacity building in three years, five years, eight years I need to do in order to capture the or threaten the military objective which we have envisaged against a country A. So now what happens if you have to increase your capacity building, your budget cannot be cut and paste. Your budget has to be allocated year by year in order to do the capacity building of the armed forces to that level at the time when probably you want to tackle those military objectives. Mm. <clears throat> so it is a very long term process. Now, let us say in another scenario, war is thrust on you, which you are not envisaged. Then what should be your political objective during that time? That is the time you have to say this, 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 I'll stop his offensive here, here, here. Then I will go on a counter offensive here, here, here. Mm. So all this are planned yearly, annually, depending upon the capability of the enemy. Now a new dimension to the entire warfare has been added by the drone warfare. Mm -hmm. Swarm yeah. drones which will come. How do you neutralize it? So, this is an ongoing match. This is a very, very dynamic way by which your military objective and your capacity building has to take place. You have to do restructuring of your armed forces based on the military objectives which you want to achieve, which in turn will achieve your political objectives. So what is the restructuring? There are two ways. You do a restructuring based on threat based. If the enemy comes and attack me, how do I deter him and then go in for offensive? Gee. Second is cap 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 capability based. If the what is my capacity building which I should do in case of an offensive which I have to launch against second sec A. What is the capacity building and how much I have to build a capacity to a two and a half front war? I may need 50 squadrons in order to track the lines of communication, sea lanes of communication in Indian Ocean. I may need a three aircraft carrier fleet with a two in reserve, five aircraft carrier fleet. I may need three mountain core, two mountain core offensive strike course. All this is the capacity building, which when you have a military objective, you can do it. When okay. you don't have a national security strategy, when you do not have a national military strategy, that means you do not have a military objective in view, then what you are doing is crisis in management. Do this, uh, buy this, buy that, buy this, buy that. Oh, this year budget is not there, so buy it next year. Huh? That cut and paste budget in which, which we generally do. Because same, how much is 1.9, 2.1 is allocated to defense. 2.1, we'll be happy if 2.1 is given. So like that. Like that, we are managing <coughs> by crisis without a cogent strategy for capability building, force restructuring, without a military objectives in view. 
because we do not have a political objective. But in spite of it, our armed forces envisage if this is given, this is ours. If this is given, this is ours. So mm. we have a number of contingency plans due to which we have a prospective plan, which is often not followed because budgeting doesn't take place. Because you have a plan and keep it in your hands, who the hell bothers? That, that prospective plan will be based on a national security strategy signed by the uh, political uh, masters. Only when it is, then it has cognizance and it has got the relevance to for us to ask so much of budget in order to do capacity building. So it is free for all. Uh, Adi, free for all. You do what you want. We'll give you what we can. Okay, restructuring. Like uh, uh, Anthony released a two-line directive in 2008. Indian Army, be prepared. Indian Armed Forces, be prepared for a two-front war. Are if you have told me to be prepared for a two-front war, what is the what is the budgeting? Well, if that is budgeting, what is my capacity building? Just issuing this, you know, anyway, less said the better. Next. Any any other. Absolutely. So the, the, I mean, those days were terrible. As a matter of fact, we had a we had a statement coming about the two, 2013 Depsang issue saying that it's small acne, pimple on our forehead. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember that. I wanted to mm. burst that pimple right there. Mm. Anyways. So, you know, I, I, I can't resist myself but to ask you. Uh, and 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 this is something. I mean, I, I try and justify to myself to kind of feel better. So, I probably am completely wrong. We lost our identity. You know, our identity was changed. We were divided. We were. I mean, whole lot of things were done to us. Uh, we don't crib about it like the Chinese hundred years of humiliation. We've been humiliated for a millennia. We don't crave about it. We are pretty happy with what we have and we'll gain it back. That's not a problem. And I'm quite confident by the time uh, another 30 years, we'll be a good, strong country. Today, the word Bharat is becoming very popular. <laughs> right? It is, I mean, I, I wonder why the controversy is, but I guess politics in India just creates a controversy about everything. That's one of the reasons why I don't talk about it in my channel. So, because, you know, we just so stuck in it all the time. <laughs> Bharat also has, I mean, I, I, I we've done a show where we've kind of figured out that the roundel started, the circle of this country started from Bharat. It became Hindustan. It became India. Are we continuing the journey back to Bharat? And what does that entail as far as the grand narrative in India will, uh, will stand, sir? See, firstly, Bharat is, I, I don't understand the controversy of this. Oh, so if an Just egg like breaks the wrong direction, na, if you break an egg yeah. in the wrong direction, there will be a controversy in this country. So, yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> you go into the parliament and if the treasury benches says India should be great, the opposition will say, no, no, it's an attack hmm. against the Indian India. India should be bad. <laughs> <laughs> India should be poor. Huh? So that's why I told you. Unfortunately, we have lost our entire bearings. What is the first sentence in the Indian Constitution, Article 1? India, that's a union of, say, a union, a, a yeah, union of states that is India, also is also Bharat. Something. In first sentence, India and Bharat comes. Either you call India or Bharat, it is same. It, is a, it has been signed by the Constitution. So there is no controversy. These fellows want to create a controversy. See, there are a number of... See, what I am trying to say, all this happens because number of moles have been created in our system which will not let India progress. There is a lot of obstacles. The CIA, the Soros lobby, and there is a, what you call... Now, for example, again I say, the recent statement by the minister in Tamil Nadu, he's <laughs> a instant. He should make, his father should train him to be the next prime minister after 30, 40 years. 
Why not? There should be a prime minister from the south also. All he has to say is that one difference in the caste and creed, caste system has to be eradicated. He will be hailed as the greatest social reformer. But what is he telling? He is telling a dharma should be a religion which is followed by 80% have to be eradicated. Anything which you do, now you have that attack point of Chandrayaan 3 as Shiv Shakti. It is, there is a problem. Why do you not have a secular name? <laughs> Why this communist leader, Sitaram, actually as Sitaram, it's a, it's a non-secular name. He should have a chair or something, or chair, table, inanimate object as his name. So that he doesn't sound, he becomes more secular. Rahul means Surya. Why have that name? Have it more secular. So we have Siv Shakti, and that has been answered by Sadhguru very well, I don't know. So one yeah, of yeah. the one of the persons asked, why Shiv Shakti in a country which is secular? What is Apollo? Uh, what is Neptune? He what says is all, Pluto, Uranus, everything <laughs> is of great gods. Great gods. If great gods, you have no objection. Why do you have about Shiv Shakti? So the Malaysians so, call their airlines with their uh, ancient name. Yaduda. The Southeast Asian, yeah, they don't have. Yaduda no airlines. Yeah. Entire Southeast Asia, you see the, anyway. Leave that. Coming back to the favorite question you asked. Constitutionally, there is nothing wrong. India and Bharat is the same. Yeah. What you want to tell, you can say. If you go back to your roots, it's Bharat. Let us take the, our country. You see the pristine culture. We have got and Sanatan Dharm or something originated much before all other religions. It is an evolution which had taken place. It was not a founded. All our Muslim, Christian, all Sikh brothers, all were a part of Sanatan Dharm. At some point of time, when this Indian philosophy, or I may say Sanatan Dharm philosophy was evolved, all our forefathers contributed to the evolution of Indian philosophy. Whether I am a Christian today or a Hindu today or a Muslim today or whatever we are today, our forefathers, our ancestors all contributed to the evolution of Indian philosophy. Don't feel shy of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sir. Why should you? Huh? So there is nothing what you call. Uh, now, what is happening is this is just. Uh, uh, because uh, our our particular religion is so tolerant. Well, 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 you know what Swami Vivekananda says: tolerance is a bit of condescending. Don't tell called tolerance. You accept it. Huh? You accept it without any reservation. That is what is acceptance. Total acceptance of other religion and not tolerance. Tolerance means you are not liking it, but you are it's, uh, okay. You are tolerating it. That is not the word. When the when the dharma of this country, Sanatan dharma, has accepted all other religions in total acceptance, hmm. because everyone has got a belief which I respect. Such type of statements will only try to divide the country. And I have told you in a, in a larger scenario of a hybrid warfare. Politicians making these statements, small politicians playing with the religions. Religions uh, are uh, become a mandate uh, for certain reservations and uh, privileges. All this is leading to dividing the country. I don't know whether you have read my uh, article on uh, when I was in the National Human Rights. I went around the hostels, let the other uh, viewers also know it, in the hostels, <coughs> residential government hostels, where boys and girls of 10 years and above come to study from their villages and be, uh, be resident uh, students in that particular hostel. There is a SC hostel, there is a OBC hostel, there is a ST hostel. 
So the end man, boy of 10 years comes and says, I am a ST and this is my hostel. A 10 year old end girl comes and I am a OBC, this is my hostel. So you are dividing the society by giving the privileges. I don't mind, please give all the privileges. But don't call it SC hostel, ST hotel, OBC hostel. Tell it. Every hostel should have all sorts of people in it. Some upper class, lower class, Brahmin, this one, economically backward. And make it like that. So that when they are growing together. Now, this is a ghetto mentality. I want to tell you from this AC hostel, <coughs> when they go to government school, they go together in one ghetto form. They attend the school government school and come back in that same ghetto. They do not mix up with other classes, other castes and all. Due to which they are so completely, we, have, we are leading away from the topic, but we are so what clubbed together in our outlook. I saw in a particular SC hostel, I found that there was photos which have to be put in some hostels, uh, uh, Gandhi's, Nehru's, Sebastian Rabos and all is put in schools. Mm. But when you go to this SC hostel, there were only two photographs. One is Ambedkar and one was Jajivan Ram. No one is afraid because of the SCST, uh, what you call act, we can go against them. No one from the government uh, asked, yeah, the district education officer was with me, asked him, why are the other photos not there? I felt, see, I told Baba Ambedkar is a great leader of mine. Babu Jajjivan Ram is a great leader of mine. But as a nation, don't we have leaders like Gandhi, Nehru, Subhas Chandra Bose, Vallabhai Patel and all? How are you, I asked the warden, how are you training these fellows to join the national mainstream? You have told a boy of 10 till he goes out of the hostel that your only two leaders are Jajjivan Ram and Ambedkar. Is it correct on your part? Is it good for the nation? Uh, Is this the outcome which you are giving him? So this entire country, in all the hostels, KC, OBC, this one, you have put a stamp on these youngsters with tremendous capability that here are your crutches and you walk with it for your life. And this is also national security strategy. To have a harmonious population, to have a seamless population, to have a population for an aspirant India, to empower our children to be better citizens of the country so that our governance is better. Absolutely. Not, 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 not uh, what you call, uh, uh, enslave them, put a mill around their neck. You are a SC, you will get this. You will OBC, you will get this. You are that, you are that. You are below caste. It is we, we, we who are perpetuating, institutionalize the perpetuation of the societal subdivisions is what India is doing it from 1947 onwards. So how can there be unity in this country? <laughs> I hope we can rise above all this stuff, sir, because at the end of it, one can see a certain small little star spark that, that lit up a few years ago where uh, people have, of, of at least <coughs> people have decided, of course, at least the words are coming out that we need to stop this nonsense. You know, that is, that is more than, Absolutely. more than a lot that we had before. Uh, words do get converted into actions and then that thing goes forward. So I guess I guess we are, uh, you know, on the cusp of that. And I call this the great reset of India, sir. You Absolutely. Know? Very well put. Because, uh, why? Because everything is kind of, you know, the everything is hit the fan. You know what I'm saying. And that's the worst that you can go, right? The tensions will keep on Absolutely. increasing to a point where the society will realize... That if you keep doing this, you're going to hurt yourself. So just back off. Absolutely. No, you just, the leaders hurt you. 
yeah, yeah. I hope hmm. we reach that point and become a little more mature about things because, uh, hmm. as you mentioned, uh, you know, politics and hatred for one or the other, I, and I, I'm not saying anything about one or the other, can result into a lot of issues that the country should not face. And I think that you brought out very, very well, sir. Uh, sir, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic episode. I must say, I didn't even realize that we've crossed an hour. Uh, it was a fantastic, fantastic talk. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And forget the talking, sir. It's always a pleasure learning from you. So it's 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 an always an honor to have you on the show. And I, you know, I look forward to, for finding deep topic topics that I can actually uh, talk to you about because that's that's where I see you shining the best. So thank you so much for actually bringing about the light into this game. And I hope to see you back very soon. Till then, sir. Jai Hind. Thank you, Adi. Thanks. It's my privilege. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir.